welcome. Uh, I'm Karen Kornblu, Director of the Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative here at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. We're a program that is dedicated to ensuring that technology supports democracy. And so uh, we're delighted to be hosting this event focused on the very important issue of export controls that have been put in place by the US, Europe, and our allies following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As with sanctions, the Alliance responded with remarkable speed uh, to block exports of sensitive technology to the Russian Federation. Uh, the event today uh, will explore the impact of US and uh, EU export controls, uh, in, including on semiconductors and the effect these new enforcement regimes will have on both the Russian economy and global trade flows. So I'm delighted to welcome our two distinguished panelists. Uh, they are uh, Thea D. Rosman Kendler. Uh, she is the Assistant Secretary for Commerce for Export Administration at the Bureau of Industry and Security. Uh, this may not be uh, a bureau that you're familiar with, but uh, it's becoming more and more important. And you'll hear about uh, the ways in which it is now. Immediately before joining the administration, she was a prosecutor in the Department of Justice's National Security Division, handling complex investigations and prosecutions affecting US national security and strategic trade controls. And earlier she served in business counsel's office, including during the initial years of export control reform. And we're also delighted to have with us today, Denis Regenet. He is the Deputy Director General and Chief Trade Enforcement Officer at the European Commission's Directorate General for Trade. He previously served as Director for WTO Legal Affairs and Trade in Goods at DG Trade. Uh, we'll start with an informal moderated session, and then about halfway in, we'll turn to the audience for questions. Please use the Q&A function uh, to ask your questions, and, and I'll direct them to our panelists. So, um, Thea, if I could start with you, um, can you just give us a quick overview, or take as long as you like, actually, give us an overview of the current export controls being applied to Russia, what they were intended to accomplish, and the initial effect they appear to be having on Russian industry. Sure, thank you so much, Karen. And, and thank you to the German Marshall Fund for hosting this uh, re really timely and uh, important event. We are, I, I'm pleased to, to be here today and especially pleased to be on the panel today with Denis Redonnet, who uh, I last spoke with yesterday uh, we are we are in close contact, uh, and uh, hopefully you you all will see over the course of of the next hour um, uh, cooperation in 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 practice and uh, well in speech, which which is followed by action. Um, let let me start by saying that that Russia's senseless invasion of Ukraine has been horrifying and and brutal, and everything you hear today about our export controls response. Is, is part of the, the powerful multilateral response that has simply been demanded by Russia's act, actions and, and Belarus's enabling of those actions. As the president explained, our export controls on Russia were designed to impose severe costs immediately and over time. He said that we would strike a blow to Russia's ability to continue to modernize their military, degrade their aerospace industry, hurt their ability to build ships, and provide a major hit to Putin's long-term strategic ambitions. So in crafting our controls in concert with our allies and partners, we worked through three key questions. Which items were important to Russia's military capabilities? Which entities support Russia's military? And how can we in the United States maximize our impact, particularly given the fact that the United States has relatively low trade volume with Russia? So we started in, in, our, in crafting our controls with the most sensitive technologies, which are our multilaterally controlled technologies. We had already in the United States generally denied these items to Russia in response to the events in 2014. This year, we adopted an even more restrictive policy of denial. We also focused on dual use items in the key sectors, as the president noted, of defense, aerospace, and marine. 
That's where we started. We have since broadened those controls to all items on our commerce control list with the actions published last week. We established license requirements for all items destined to military end users. And to maximize our impact, we expanded the reach of our controls through the use of foreign direct product rules. And that means that certain pr foreign produced items manufactured using certain US technologies are controlled as if they were US items. Now that measure isn't necessary for our allies and partner countries that have adopted their own controls that are substantially similar to ours. There's no need for a German company to obtain a license from BIS for such items when, when, they can, when BAFA is positioned to adjudicate those licenses consistent with the EU rules. So the rules we crafted to address those questions that I identified and, and the mechanisms that I laid out they were crafted in coordination with this growing coalition, this export controls coalition of now 38 countries, uh, including, of course, the EU member states. Those controls are powerful, and we see that they are having meaningful effects already. The Commerce Department has used export controls to severely restrict Russia's ability to obtain the commodities, software, and technologies it needs to support its military and defense industrial base. We've also placed restrictions, as I noted, on Russia's enabler, Belarus, and clamped down on the ability of oligarchs and other malign actors to obtain luxury goods from the world's leading economies. We've tightened restrictions on Russia's ability to get equipment that supports oil refining, a key source of Russia's revenue, and added comprehensive export restrictions for over 250 parties who provide support to Russia's military. They've been added to the Commerce Department's entity list. But let me be clear that we have not aimed these controls at the Russian people. We are still providing some case-by-case -case review of licenses related to humanitarian needs. And we have excluded food and medicine from our controls. Unless they're, well, yes. Generally speaking, most lower level technology can still be sent to Russia, although not to the Russian military. We know that export controls are most powerful when they are multilateral. And that is why we've worked so hard with our global partners to develop an aligned export control response. The effect of these controls compound over time as Russia's defense industry loses its ability to maintain what it has, produce more of what it needs, or develop new technologies that it wants. Since February 24th, US exports of items subject to new license requirements have decreased 99% by value compared to the same time period last year. Our actions to date demonstrate our solidarity with the people of Ukraine, our commitment to the rule of law, and the power of our international partnerships. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, running through those. It's hard for us all to keep, to keep track of it. So um, it, it's very helpful. Denise, um, can you pick up and give us from the European side how you've approached this and uh, what, the, what the view is? Oh, thanks very much for, for having me as well on the on on the on the call, uh, and it's great to be with Tara here, in, interacting in a small public setting and building on the on the on, indeed on the on the the context that we're having on a on a very very regular basis uh, in the context of the design and the implementation of the of the sanctions uh, on Russia. For for us, from our perspective, of course, we come at this from different tradition, different legal system different instruments in the way we, we operate uh, of course out of the EU not being a unitary uh, state uh, and, and so there has been a tremendous amount of adaptation and very rapid shifts uh, in the context of the development of these successive uh, sanctions package including and in particular on the on the export control side just to put it a bit first in in, in a slightly broader broader context I mean evidently the invasion of Ukraine, for us in Europe, uh, is the gravest threat uh, uh, to European security in, in decades. It's a massive existential uh, event. And that's why the EU's response has been multifaceted on the political, the financial, the material, the humanitarian side with respect to Ukraine, uh, uh, including doing a whole host of unprecedented things, and uh, not just in the trade and uh, export zone, but also in many other fields of the policy response, I'm thinking of provision of military uh, items, uh, the welcoming of millions of refugees inside the, uh, the European Union's uh, jurisdiction, 
uh, you know, banning out of the EU, for example, media outlets, which is something that we had not done before. So there's a range of, of, of issues. And if you take all these measures together, I think it does constitute a sort of a new type of, of economic statecraft in a way which indeed is about leveraging our economic potential uh, in the face of that uh, aggression, but also leveraging uh, uh, the economic potential of, of allies. And I think that has been very important to construct in the design of, uh, of measures. Um, I think in order to make uh, the war increasingly costly uh, uh, for Russia, and also in order, and that's very much the story, I think, on the export side, in order to, over time, uh, degrade Russia's uh, financial, technological, industrial capacity and prospects going beyond the, the military. That is part and parcel of that economic uh, response. And that's also why, as a result, we have a, a set of sanctions uh, with successive packages that are uh, that is intense uh, and that is fairly complex because it adds various layers of policy responses in, in different areas. You know uh, that that is the case on the financial side of the financial sanctions, the financial restrictions, uh, but also now moving into a number of measures on transport and then indeed direct trade measures, which uh, are both in our case very much on the export side and the import side. Uh, as well, you know, we started with an import ban on steel products to, to disorganize a key infrastructural industrial sector uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, and with the, the, the latest uh, package uh, of sanctions adopted last week by uh, the council uh, in, in, uh, in Brussels, uh, we obviously have added a very significant tranche of, of measures, including in trade, adding a restriction on exports of both uh, a range of industrial products and additional advanced technologies. Uh, a range of industrial products where we have identified that Russian economy is highly dependent on imports coming from G7 nations and allied nations. And where our assessment economically is that the potential for backfilling by other jurisdictions remain relatively limited. So there is a, if you want that sort of trade logic applied to the, the, to the, uh, the design of the measures on the, on the export side. And we've also of course broadened significantly uh, the measures on the import side in order to, uh, to hit into a non-significant export revenues uh, uh, streams for, for, for Russia or, or hitting a number of signature uh, Russian export uh, export items. So uh, this uh, these concerted EU US export restrictions at the core. If I move to the export side now, I think that they, they in a way they're both massive and they're unprecedented at the same time. They're massive certainly on our side in economic terms because if you look at what we have done currently, we now have under sanctions about a quarter of the value of uh, pre-war EU EU exports. Uh, so that's not insignificant given the fact that we had in 2021 80 billion euros worth of exports uh, uh, into Russia. And of course, that is uh, much more significant in terms of, of that economic effect than the, the measures of the United States themselves, simply because of the, the nature or the intensity of the trade relationship that, that we had. I think it's a factor of 18 or 19, I'm never quite sure, uh, uh, in terms of the, the depth or the importance of the economic relationship. But it's also very unprecedented in the way it has been it has been designed and coordinated. And there maybe I think I, I think it's worth perhaps then spending a couple of minutes more on on why uh, this is important and different from from our side, and what has enabled this on the on the EU side beyond, of course, simply the the political determination of the EU and US leadership to have uh, uh, that sort of response. But in terms of the instrument, I think that, that there are perhaps three things that are worth mentioning. One is that um, one of the factors that has enabled this um, unprecedented uh, EU-US response on export is the, is the shifts that we had been experiencing and started to experience in the EU's own export control policy uh, uh, framework uh, over the last a uh, uh, couple of preceding uh, years. And obviously, the EU member states remain very attached to the traditional export controls stemming from the multilateral regimes, 
But at the same time, the new EU export control regulation, our basic legal statute for doing export controls and coordinating the work of export control authorities at national level in Europe, was we adopted in May uh, last year, and it came into force in September, had already opened the door to new forms of EU autonomous uh, controls, for example, on cyber surveillance technologies, but also on emerging market technologies uh, uh, more generally. It has also created a basis which was not existing before for enhanced uh, intra-EU information exchange about controls, for working in a more joined up manner on enforcement, which is of course going to become extremely important going forward with respect to the Russia peace and create a basis for working with partners to promote uh, a, a greater convergence of, of controls. Uh, that's also reflecting, I think, a change in mindset uh, on our side, where traditionally we've had export controls and sanctions very politically distinct, although technically uh, 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 closely related. I think the response to the invasion of Ukraine has made clear that this distinction has moved and has transformed in a way export controls on our side from an instrument that traditionally we use to address uh, long-term threats, yeah. the proliferation, to the ability to use it as an instrument, as an instrument of statecraft, as an economic statecraft to manage uh, acute situations of conflict, uh, such as this one. And that is a very important and new development. And finally, uh, it, what you have seen, I guess, is that things have changed as well in the um, in the context of the execution of uh, the Russia sanctions, the design, the preparation and the adoption of the sanctions. We have been able to adopt these measures in record time. So we have in a way demonstrated that in the EU, the national foreign and security policy prerogatives uh, that are still vested with the member states are not an obstacle to uh, a rapid adoption of the sort of robust export controls that we have put in place in an allied manner with the United States and other allies. And that speed of, of action, I think, is a very, very important development. And frankly, I can tell you as an old Brussels bureaucrat, a, a pretty significant achievement in terms of the ability of the EU machine to produce uh, uh, policy. Um, we have substantially, of course, broadened the scope of controls to advanced uh, technologies. So in a way, what we have done in the context of Russia sanction is we've pioneered and accelerated what we had planned to do over time through the development of our new export control regime. But we have done this at phenomenally accelerated, accelerated speed. And now we are able to turn in a, in a much more joined up manner at EU level towards the issues of uniform implementation, effective enforcement, which I think going forward are going to be extremely important, notably in the context of the implementation of these uh, of these trade sanctions uh, on Russia. And perhaps I'll leave it there and we can go into yeah. this, I guess, later in the, in the conversation. Thank right. you. And I, I really want to pick up on, on some of the points that you made and this idea of a new kind of economic statecraft uh, that's being demonstrated by these actions, I think is very interesting. And Thea, I wonder if you could dig down a little bit. You mentioned the foreign uh, product rule, and I think that's it's a really innovative new technique. I, I believe it was pioneered in relation to Huawei, and I, I think there's some confusion about it. Some folks have even talked about it as having like an extraterritorial uh, concerns. I'm just wondering if you could talk about, about it a little bit and, and, uh, and what's new about it and what's so effective about it. Sure, Karen, happy to. Uh, now, we've never applied a foreign direct product rule to a country or to a military before. And, and uh, in the last uh, month and a half, we've applied it to Russia and Belarus and separately to the Russian military and the Belarusian militaries. So uh, it is being used in an innovative way. Uh, it does build on uh, what was done with respect to Huawei. Um, the, the basic idea is, um, and, and I'll avoid some of the technical uh, specifics, but the basic idea is that if certain US technologies are being used in a manufacturing facility, for example, um, you know, a, a tool that is from built in the United States and is being used on a manufacturing line to produce semiconductors, uh, that tool is subject to our regulations 
and its utility in manufacturing chips, those chips that come out of that production line would also be subject to our regulations. And um, we are trying to be creative in, in how we approach this, this horrifying situation. And this seemed like a, uh, a mechanism that would really cut off the Russian military from fundamental inputs it needs to maintain uh, it, its hardware. So uh, I, I think we've seen that, that there has been general compliance so far in, um, in, in, with our controls, both in the, in the countries that are part of our coalition and in, with, from companies that are not in our coalition member states. Uh, so, so we've been pleased with how, how this has come to fruition. Great. Um, uh, Denise, maybe I can just pick up uh, on what you were talking about before and dig in a little bit on semiconductors, because those have been a focus for both the U.S. and the EU, uh, which have focused on semiconductor manufacturing. Can you explain how the, the sanctions and the export controls related to semiconductors work together and what the intention is and how they're going to impact um, both uh, the Russian military and um, and maybe efforts by the by the uh, Russian leadership to diversify the economy. Um, sure. I mean, so uh, evidently, uh, semiconductors I think are you know important uh, set of items to uh, to do what I was expressing before, which is that we we need to have measures in place that are going to to downgrade or to degrade. Uh, Russia's technological and industrial capacity over time, and, and clearly uh, semiconductors uh, are also almost a, co a commodity in, in, in that. Um, obviously, here we're extending uh, additional uh, controls uh, in this area, which were not in, certainly not in place, not envisaged on our side uh, uh, before. If you look at uh, what has been taken, what has been done basically in the second uh, sanctions package on our side on, on Russia and now more recently in the fifth sanctions package that we just adopted uh, 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 last week we're moving into uh, advanced semiconductors advanced technology targeting quantum technology it doesn't mean that any type of chip is, is, is caught it's the advanced uh, chips or chip making technology that we're trying to to, to impact and in a way, it, 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 it has become inevitable and it is something on a, an issue on which industry is progressively uh, adapting. We had already been on the European side, by the way, impacted by some of the extraterritorial effects of US measures in the past in the area of semiconductors. And that has led us to engage, uh, notably uh, under the auspices of the Trade and Technology Council, precisely to uh, see how we can avoid some of the, those unintended effects uh, uh, between jurisdictions that are essentially convergent in terms of what they want to achieve with export control uh, policy, as we have demonstrated now in the case of the, the Russia sanctions. I think industry it's a, is, is a sector that's already quite switched on to, to controls and, and that is very sensitive as well to the need for due diligence, which is another element uh, that we have in the panoply of, of, policy, of policy measures in the, in the sector. But I think that uh, that on semiconductors, uh, which in a way was already a nucleus of cooperation between EU and US bilaterally under the Trade and Technology Council, and now going beyond this, looking at uh, a lot of the other areas that we're covering in the uh, con export controls in the case of Russia, we have a basis for, for enhanced uh, EU-US cooperation. And I think the name of the game now is going to be to to really pivot the work of the, the framework that we have in place between us, which is at its core, the Trade and Technology Council established by the leadership on both sides, precisely to deepen that, uh, that cooperation. Uh, and, and, and in a way, the, what we have done uh, over the last uh, couple of months together in the preparation and implementation of the Russia sanctions is a precursor uh, from our point of view to structured cooperation uh, going forward. At least that's how we see the, the way in which the, 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 the structures of cooperation such as the TTC can be made, uh, can be put to, put to use in the, in the relationship. Great, yeah, so you saved me asking you about the TTC. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I wanted to pick up on this really, imp I'm, I'm just gonna ask you each one more question because we have a lot of questions coming in. So I don't wanna hog the mic. 
But I do want to ask about um, compliance from third parties and uh, who might try to fill in the supply gap. And I wondered what actions are being taken to ensure there's not that kind of leakage. Sure, I can start with that. Um, we are obviously very focused on backfill, not just because, uh, well, for starters, because of our national security goals of actually cutting Russia off from the uh, parts and components and items that it's trying to obtain uh, for its military, but, but also because we wanna maintain a level playing field for industry and uh, it, it, it's simply not appropriate uh, for profiteering to occur in this space. So uh, for, for many, uh, for primarily national security, but also for, you know, we sit in the Commerce Department for uh, industry reasons, we, um, we're very focused on the question of backfill behind uh, the void created in the market by our controls. And I'm very fortunate to work with um, some terrific export enforcement uh, agents who are looking very closely at this issue. We expect compliance. Uh, we, we expect compliance from companies operating outside of our coalition members and you know, less concern inside the coalition members. Um, the products that they make that are subject to our foreign direct product rules uh, also come under the, the scope of U.S. enforcement authorities. Yeah. And um, our, our enforcement team is not hesitating to take action. Uh, you've seen some of their announcements about planes uh, and, and putting the world on notice of certain planes that, that may have violated the regulations. We've also started to see some enforcement action out of the Department of Justice uh, and, and here in the Department of Commerce. I don't think that there is um, a capacity to fully uh, backfill against what the, the world's leading economies have taken away uh, from the market, uh, particularly in more advanced uh, technology. But uh, we, we will not hesitate. I think our deputy secretary used the phrase uh, at their peril to, to describe the uh, the actions of companies that seek to evade our controls. They do so at their peril. We can uh, impose uh, company-specific license requirements at the very least, and we can uh, debar, uh, we can bar trading in U.S. goods. Uh, and that's not even, bef that's before we get to criminal consequences uh, under the Department of Justice. So uh, I, I we have fortunately seen compliance uh, yeah. for the most part but uh, we, we will not hesitate to take enforcement action where appropriate. So I, I would just follow up with one more question for you, which is you had mentioned the humanitarian case-by-case -case review for humanitarian purposes. And it seems, it seems like there, there are two very related issues. One is sort of humanitarian access to the internet and to information. And another is um, the use of some of this lower end uh, technology software and so on for doing business in Russia. And a lot of um, Western companies have pulled out either a little bit or a lot voluntarily um, in part out of support uh, for the allies and, and, and because they're appalled at what Russia is doing and don't want to support it. And in part, because it's just hard to do payments. So it, it's hard for them to function in Russia. And um, I just wonder how you do it. I don't know if you have a view about whether those companies will go back in, you know, where you see the humanitarian piece versus the, you know, um, cloud services, software services, et cetera, and where, you know, where this issue of, of getting, making sure that, that Russians who want to get access to information are able to get access to information. It's a great question, um, and, and we are certainly committed to exempting essential humanitarian, humanitarian and related activities that benefit the Russian people. Um, in addition to food and medicine, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think your question gets at um, our, our uh, enabling of telecommunications services. Yeah. Uh, and, and indeed, that is to support the flow of information and access to the internet, internet um, with the goal of providing outside perspectives to the Russian people. Uh, so, so that they can get information from a source other than the Russian government. 
Um, we, we did not target these activities and um, U.S. companies can continue to operate in these sectors in Russia. I understand um, the, the concerns about uh, obtaining payment and um, you, you know, the conditions of operation. Uh, it, it's, I think the White House put out a statement on this, uh, noting that uh, relevant departments and agencies will issue appropriate exemptions and carve outs to ensure that humanitarian activities are not disrupted. So uh, I, I think that's where uh, we, should, we should stay on that point, um, trying to in, facilitate those, those activities where, where appropriate. Great, thank you. And then I'll just ask um, mm -hmm. one other question um, uh, in the hopes that we can make news today, but I'm not, I'm not hugely optimistic. So Janine, um, it's, uh, it's been stated that unlike the financial sanctions, export controls are a, take a, a slower toll, even though you said that these are new ones that have a more acute effect. Um, are, there, are there additional um, export controls, uh, other tools that the US and the EU could apply in the coming uh, weeks if things uh, go on? I don't. I don't anticipate I'm going to trick you into making news. Yeah, no, I, I'm. I'm not going to speculate on, on on additional sanctions in a public event, as you can appreciate. Uh, out of out of being uh, a careful bureaucrat, and also simply because I simply do not know what our, our political leadership is going to be uh, moving towards in this area. You know that there is a a lot of debate and an ongoing debate inside the EU, uh, certainly, but also in the United States, on the question of or how to progressively tighten the range of sanctions that we have in place. Maybe I'll just say a couple of things, though, in relation to this. I think it is correct that we see the, the export control piece playing in the, in the medium uh, to long term, notably through technological uh, uh, controls. But I think we should not underestimate the, the uh, immediate combined impact of the different measures and how those are playing out. And you said so yourself. Uh, the combination of the trade measures, the financial uh, measures and the impact on payment insurance, uh, as well as now on, on, on the European side, in particular, the road transport ban has been introduced, which is going to affect a lot of the, of the, of the uh, current merchandise trade, uh, means that there is a, a significant chilling effect on trade flows going up above and beyond uh, sanctioned uh, trade. Uh, it's very clear from the high frequency customer data that we're, that we're gathering. Um, and, uh, and in a way, it's also a reflection of the fact that at company level, there is a, a fair amount of, of overcompliance. And in some cases, simply of, of private sector choices that have to do with the, the reevaluation of, of risk and, and reputational uh, effects. And all this is, is, is playing in a way which is very difficult to disentangled from the actual direct impact of, of the sanctions, we have ourselves, like the United States, built in our export control uh, regime uh, uh, a very carefully targeted set of exemptions and, and exceptions. It's an export control regime with those exemptions and, and, and exceptions. For example, for software upgrades, cybersecurity protection, uh, things that go in the direction of the issues that you were raising right now, uh, an exemption for non-public electronic communications network, which we have clarified in the context of the adoption of the revised regulation uh, uh, in the fifth package uh, uh, last week. And at the same time, obviously, we are not in the business of, of obliging businesses to continue in Russia. There's a commercial decision there that has to do with risk as I said, reputation, and that has to do as well with the perception of the threat of Russian counter sanctions, which uh, is uh, yeah. very significant uh, uh, also, uh, and is playing out vis-a-vis uh, -vis a whole range of, of, uh, of industry uh, uh, players and, and sectors uh, on our side. Uh, we've had today here in Brussels uh, a, a very large uh, interaction with um, EU uh, federations, associations of various uh, industrial uh, and business sectors. And we see that all these uh, uh, measures and effects are playing uh, in sync at the moment. And that's just simply a reality of the situation on the ground. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's I think this issue of, of uh, 
the non-humanitarian piece, but the, you know, what other uh, technologies available, uh, even if it's not dual use is really interesting. We have a couple of questions about that. I'm going to, I'm going to mix them together with Japan and Taiwan. Uh, and Thea, maybe you can start. Um, how, how are the uh, U.S. and EU coordinating with Japan, other like-minded countries to align dual-use export controls. And then there's another question about Taiwan, and uh, is there an opportunity to refashion our multilateral export control regimes uh, to include Taiwan as a member, given their centrality in semiconductor manufacturing? So take take those however you like. Maybe we can start with the Japan question. I, I, I suspect Denis and I will have uh, similar responses that uh, our, our coordination with Japan has been excellent. Uh, we've been working very closely with our Japanese counterparts and uh, they, they are a critical member of, of our uh, coalition on export controls. Uh, Denis, I don't know if you wanna add to that or? or... Um, yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, you know, I've talked, to, I've talked to earlier about the, the bilateral EU-US uh, alignment and cooperation that we built into this, uh, the, the, the adoption of the, of, of the sanctions uh, over, the last, uh, over the last months. Um, I think beyond that uh, bilateral perspective, there, there is a need for, for cooperation with other partners and that's Japan. Uh, in our case, we have a very close cooperation given the, the trade links that we have with the United Kingdom, uh, but with also with other partners engaging with countries like Korea and, 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 and many others. And, and the US has acknowledged this in, in your uh, uh, regulations. You mentioned uh, the, the deployment of the, the foreign direct uh, product rule. We have also in our legal regime, sanctions regime, uh, created a notion of partner country for those countries that indeed are progressively adopting substantially equivalent measures. And that carries a number of, of consequences in terms of how we in, uh, apply uh, European controls, including on, on subsidiaries from these jurisdictions. Um, and that de facto provides a, a bit of an innovative model uh, in, in the way we, we work uh, in an allied manner on, on export control. Certainly for us, this is a, this is a, a, a new area of, of work. And that's the sort of thing which uh, we are indeed working on together right now with, with Thea and, and, and other colleagues. And so to get uh, even further um, afield, uh, there's, there are a few questions about China and um, whether the work in the TTC uh, on to, to uh, think through export controls may have some application in the future uh, on on China, and then also um, whether these this this uh, uh, Russia oriented collaboration of allies uh, on these Russia export controls and sanction become the base of a new arrangement. Uh, should we should should we decide to impose controls on on China? I think that's the gist of these two questions. I don't know if either of you wants to take that. I can, I can, yeah. Yeah, you want to start there, yeah, maybe? Oh, sure. I, th I thought it was your turn, but no, I'm happy. I'm happy to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and this ties back, Karen. You, you were asking about Taiwan and regimes too. But yeah. let me let me tackle the regime uh, issue first. I think we we are understanding that Vasna arrangement doesn't have a function for removing a member. Um, and we have never been in a situation before where we have had a regime member, I don't think, invade another regime member. Uh, the, I, I don't think that we are at a point where we want to uh, talk about replacing a regime, but I certainly think that we are in the beginning stages of thinking about what comes next and, and how we can... Um, adjust our export controls to match the, the current environment of the world. Uh, so, so it's certainly, I, I, I hate to disappoint you, I'm not going to make news, I don't think on this and announce anything here, but, it, but it's certainly something that we are thinking about and, and trying to understand what, what the world looks like with Russia having, having conducted this senseless invasion and, and how we need to stay nimble and consider current threats uh, as, as we strategize about export controls. So I'm also not going to speculate on new members uh, of, of such, an, such a possible future uh, uh, 
organization or, or arrangement. But I do think that it can think, we should be thinking broadly in, in how we think about the goals and, and the, um, the, the, the issues of the world, the, the national security issues we're facing that, that such a regime or such an arrangement could, could confront. Um, but, but I don't think it's targeted at a specific country or, or anything like that. Um, Denis, maybe you can amplify on, um, yeah, on that. No, I think, <laughs> well, I think, look, I think this, this, this observation uh, that has been there for some time, and I think it's probably more prevalent in, in a debate on, on, on the United States side, perhaps than on the European side, but nevertheless exists here as consideration given to the, uh, the observation that there are certain limitations in the scope and the functioning of the existing multilateral export control regimes, and that, that there are some issues there uh, going forward. And I think that's, uh, there's a recognition certainly here as well of that, of that issue. Now we are not indeed, uh, and there I echo what, what Pierre said at, at, the, at the point of, of saying that we need to be moving to something which is particularly defined right now uh, 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 to move away from the multilateral regimes. I think we've got to look at the issues of functioning of the regimes properly uh, in, a careful, uh, in a careful manner going forward. And, and, and more generally on the question of backfilling, this is a very important issue. And again, for us, it's, it's a very important issue, uh, again, for because of the national security objective that we're all pursuing here, as they have said, but also very much for level playing field reasons. And again, you would understand from the European side, given what it means economically that we are particularly sensitive to the question of the level playing field implications of non-alignment, uh, backfilling, potential risks of circumvention and evasion of control, et cetera, given you know, the, 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 the huge economic uh, uh, impact that uh, the measures on the export side are, are having for some of our uh, exporting, uh, exporting sectors, especially when we move into areas we're talking about banning the exports of a range of capital goods, yeah. intermediate industrial products, where, of course, as you broaden the sanctions, the potential for backfilling beyond advanced technology it becomes uh, greater. Um, so, so we do, this is something where we believe we need to have not just alignment between allies, which is what we are doing and what we are, we are constructing effectively through sanction regime, I just mentioned that, but also we are very committed to uh, look at uh, coordination, joined up action where necessary in terms of addressing other jurisdictions, uh, which are not part of the coalition of countries that have aligned uh, to, uh, to, the, to the sanctions, uh, and where the question of how their positioning in, in trade uh, is, is, going to, is going to happen. With respect to China, I would just say that this issue has been a, a major issue in the context of the, the bilateral EU uh, China summit of leaders that took place uh, uh, two weeks ago now, uh, because obviously uh, uh, right now for us in the EU, uh, uh, this, this question uh, is, is central in the bilateral relationship uh, uh, with China and will inevitably remain so given again the, 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 the centrality of this security question that we are faced with with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Great. I'll, I'll turn away from these, these thorny issues to get a little bit down the rabbit hole, which a uh, very specific question, which is again on this humanitarian uh, issue that you raised, the, uh, um, someone asks about the question of medicine exceptions. And that sounds very complex. He says, since devices used in medical treatment often contain a range of sophisticated technologies, how, how does the administration handle these kinds of questions, especially in the in the area of medicine, when it goes beyond pharmaceuticals. Sure, for the for the most part, um, there what we are looking at is uh, reviewing license applications uh, and having them come in. and And for license applications, and, and frankly, this goes be, beyond uh, just the Russia situation. We look at the item itself and its applications. We look at who it's going to, the, just the, the country it's going to, and um, I guess specific to Russia, the end user, who, yeah. who will be receiving that item. And then we look at the risk of diversion and um, the chances that it will go beyond the listed end user, which may be innocuous, to uh, a malign actor. And so that's very important for us to have all the circumstances of a transaction. 
Uh, now, I can tell you that in this context for Ukraine, we are expediting those license applications where, where a license may be required for a shipment to Ukraine. We are looking at those carefully, but also very quickly because we want the Ukrainian people to get exactly what they need uh, in this time of, of existential crisis. Uh, the, uh, with, with Russia, we are looking at those carefully to understand whether the humanitarian measures are indeed met or whether there is a, 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 an opportunity for uh, misuse uh, separate from what the US applicant may uh, anticipate. Yeah, on, on our side on this question, because it's also a question that we, we face from, from the exporting uh, community, and I don't know whether the question here was coming from the US side or, or more from a European standpoint. I mean, you know, we have, we have as I was saying, we, we, we did create a, a, a set of trade measures with a very clear set of both ex ante exemptions to the, the, uh, the, the, the bans and the restrictions, and in some cases, uh, based simply on a notification requirement, uh, and in some cases, case-by-case uh, 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 case license exception regime, which of the kind that the Terra, I think, is, 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 is describing. Now, of course, we have now, we are confronted with questions of uniform application by the, the licensing authorities inside the European Union member states on these, uh, on these uh, decisions. Uh, we'll be talking to industry at both at national and European level on these uh, on these issues. I think the, the spirit in which the, the licensing authorities are applying these exceptions is very much the one that that, that they are uh, uh, described. We, we did produce guidance to the exporting community quite early on on the export control part, uh, as rapidly as we could after the adoption of the first uh, suite of, of measures uh, in March. It's very clear that given the fact that the, the fifth package of sanction augments the trade measures significantly, we will be uh, uh, adding uh, and building uh, additional uh, guidance to the exporting community in a cooperation with the competent authorities of the member states relatively rapidly because we are starting to get these kinds of questions. We've built these kinds of exceptions, I would say both on the trade measures, but similarly and in parallel on the transport restrictive measures that we've been taking because obviously everything is linked. Now that makes of course a, a fairly complex picture now, regulatory picture where you have successive stratas of measures and successive stratas of exceptions that sort of you know, overlap uh, to the point where some member states have been calling in, in, in council also for looking at the at the sort of, at, for example, the humanitarian exemptions in a more horizontal manner. I don't know uh, when when we will adapt the uh, the sanctions regulation on this, but these are things which are very much indeed on the implementation side on on the radar screen because we need to make sure that there is as much transparency and predictability as possible in the implementation of these measures, especially in these core areas that we've been we've been seeking to uh, to protect wonderful um i, I wonder um just sticking with you Denise, it, it you've talked about such a big number in terms of the trade impact uh because of the intensity of the trade uh relationship i wonder if if uh, anything is being contemplated to um to help support some of the European businesses that may be affected by this, either in terms of some relief elsewhere or um, some other kinds of creative tools. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this, it's a big shock to the to the system because the the, the, the economic uh, relationship is relatively important for a whole host of of, of sectors uh, in the in the EU. So I think there are different things that, that that are happening. I mean, first of all, there is an adjustment process to the the trading conditions overall beyond the sanction that is taking place. And there are there is a, a market, if you want, adjustment, whether it's in terms of transport, trade routes, logistics, which is happening, but which takes time. Then there is the question of whether we can support through policy, um, in particular diversification on both the export side and the import side. And that trade policy, which is federalized in the European Union, will, will play a role. It's very clear that we are now at a stage where we're reviewing uh, our, our trade policy posture to accelerate some of the negotiations and partnerships that we have with a number of countries, which are going to play a key role in the diversification 
process away from those uh, pre-existing links with Russia, Russia's economy or Belarus. And that's on the, for example, on the supply of raw materials as it is for the finding of uh, alternative outlets on, 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 on exports and trade policy can play a role there both ways. And then finally, uh, there is a, 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 at EU level, uh, a well-constructed uh, temporary framework to enable where necessary uh, some uh, uh, non-distorting state aid uh, support uh, for uh, uh, operators and sectors that are hit very, very badly because we have pockets of very high dependency. Uh, uh, again, in some products, some sectors, some member states in particular, especially those that are uh, closest geographically to Russia. And we're there, uh, the, the EU provides the possibility for member states to also uh, help cushion uh, and alleviate uh, some of these, uh, these impacts, uh, again, through a temporary state aid measures where, where, where necessary, and that has started to, to be implemented on, on our side. Terrific. I'll, I'll ask Thea one question and then um, maybe Thea, you can answer that and then lead into any final comments, observations, uh, things that we've all forgotten to ask you that you'd like to share with us. But I'm just I'm just wondering, again, looking forward, um, you know, there are sanctions, there's uh, these robust export controls, there's some voluntary actions that have been taken by companies. Uh, let's say there is some kind of um, peace agreement. Uh, is there, but Putin stays in power. Has the U.S. said anything about, um, you know, versus things go on for months and God forbid, you know, even longer. Has the U.S. said anything about um, whether it might be willing to uh, lighten some of these export controls under certain conditions? Um, is there a sense that things will continue to intensify Again, not asking you to make any news, but in the accumulation of all the things that have been said, you know, what kinds of signals are, are, are is the U.S. and, and the EU, what, what are we trying to send about um, uh, conditions uh, for various actions? I don't think we've sent any signals on that. Um, okay. we, we certainly haven't from here. Uh, the, the actions we are we are witnessing uh, in Ukraine, the reports of those actions get worse every day. Yeah, uh, I, I uh, the design of our export controls is to limit the military's ability to conduct those atrocities, uh, and and that that's where we're focused right now. Okay. Uh, to, to the extent uh, I can I can sort of close this out. Um, You know, we, we, the leading economies, uh, you know, the, these 38 nations that have come together, we recognize that our stringent export controls against uh, Russia and Belarus, these, this is a powerful national security tool. And um, we, we recognize that each time we impose export control measures, we need to consider the impact on industry. Uh, what we have learned here is, is that um, there, there are some situations in which um, the, the relationships with our partners go beyond anything else. And, and the day-to-day -day work and engagement that we have carried on with, with Denis and his team and, and with our uh, other counterparts, I, I think we've talked about Japan and the UK, but, but let's, let's be clear, there are, there are uh, many countries in this group and, and we are talking to them all regularly. These relationships that we're strengthening will carry us well past this current crisis. And uh, we, we, I, I think it's our, our view here that we are closer to our allies on export controls than we have been in decades. We have a long history, of course, of working with the EU on export controls and many, many other issues. Uh, the, as, as, tragic and, and heinous as Russia's acts are on uh, their, their assault on international values, on norms. Uh, it has simply emphasized the importance of our global partnership. Uh, and, and I hope that, that our audience today understands that, that this alliance is, is stronger than ever. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And, and that 
it's for that reason that we so much wanted to have you both. And we're so grateful. And Denise, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with us as well in closing? And, and I think the next thing we can look forward to in the TTC is a May, a May meeting, if you want to do any curtain raiser on that. Yeah. No, well, but I think uh, I just expanded what I was saying, because f- from our perspective, and again, on the export control side, coming from you know, the way we, we operate in this area, uh, it's very clear that what's happened over the last few months has been has has accelerated massively a number of transformation on our side, which enable us to engage in a much more affirmative manner with allies, uh, uh, of which, uh, of course, the United States. In terms of the speed at which we're moving some of our authorities forward, in terms of the scope and the depth of the measures that we are able to to take. All this uh, is made possible by the fact a number of things are happening at the same time, which are actually, are actually pulling in the same direction. We have to have a, a unified response to, to Russia. We had put in place already the, 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 ba- the baseline for the sort of cooperation that we're now uh, really uh, uh, exploiting in our really bilateral relationship with the US through the Trade and, and Technology Council. And we had already started to modernize our own domestic uh, uh, authorities in order to be faster and more nimble. And it's the combination of these three things, which uh, uh, hopefully associated with the right administrative resources to do all that job, will help us to, uh, to continue that engagement and in particular the bilateral cooperation. So I think definitely the, the area of export control is one area which is showing uh, promise under the Trade and Technology Council's uh, agenda. And in May, when uh, TTC leaders uh, meet, it is evident that this is, would be one area of, of, of focus, not the only area which is producing interesting deliverables in terms of transatlantic relationship, but it's certainly one area which has moved forward uh, enormously. And where, frankly, we have leapfrogged uh, compared to what we were, we were planning to do uh, you know, less than six months ago. So, uh, so that is what has been happening, and, and and our intent is to continue in the same direction, and frankly, with the same intensity as we have been doing. Because unfortunately, uh, this is not the end of the story. Certainly, on on in the in the in the context of our response to Russia, I I just want to um, express uh, a lot of gratitude to both of you for the the work you and your teams have done. I think those of us who who have hoped that the transatlantic relationship um, uh, was, you know, had seen it as so important in defending democracy, never would have wished for this kind of stress test. But um, I think the work that you and your teams have done has been uh, invaluable. And, uh, you know, we're grateful for your public service and, uh, and for you taking the time to speak to us today and to try to um, get, get, get beyond the many releases that your departments have done to try to understand what's behind it and, uh, and what it all means. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our audience for attending today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.